So we all, and by we all I mean every one of you sitting over here, we all view the world through certain implicit norms or internal lenses that are determined by our national, cultural, social, economic contexts and that set the parameters for what we consider to be normal. Now let me ask you a few questions. Is it normal for you to be able to walk into the kitchen in your house, turn on the tap and drink a glass of water? Is it normal for you, a woman, to be able to go for a walk in the evening unaccompanied? Is it normal for all of you as students to be able to get to your classroom without having to pass through metal detectors. The fact is that there is no such thing as normal. There are many normalities, there are multiple lenses through which we see the world, even if we might not always be aware of what these are. Personally, I grew up in a privileged position when it came to this awareness of the diversity in ways of looking at the world, partly because I am Indian. In India, we don't even have a language. People keep asking me, do you speak Indian? There is no such language. We have 22 official languages. We are a tapestry of different ethnicities, of races, of religions. And in addition to all of that, I grew up as an English-speaking Indian, which meant that I had access to the implicit norms of the English-speaking world. When, for example, I read Shakespeare, the great bard, comparing a beloved woman to a summer's day, may I compare thee to a summer's day? He was obviously not comparing her to a summer's day in India, which would be a terrible insult. You would only say that to your worst enemy. But the fact was that because I had access to this range of different norms, I, it was something that I was very privileged with from early on. Going back to my journey, it began in quite a standard way for somebody from my background, which was I was finished high school and I went to England to do a degree. When I graduated, I returned to India to my dream job, which was as an on-camera television reporter for one of the leading television companies in the country. This is what I had wanted to do since I was in middle school. And straight after graduating, I landed my dream job. Well, guess what? I hated it. That might sound terrible, but if only all of you could be as lucky as me as to have hated your very first dream job, because that is what then gives you the motivation to grow the wings, to fly. I didn't like television for multiple reasons. Um, the stories lacked depth. The amount of space that you get is about a one minute to do a story. It's very short. You're not really able to get into um, uh, the matter in great detail. And there was always a sense of a sort of pot boiling over somewhere, this constant sense of adrenaline, which I didn't like. So what was I to do? I decided to take a pause, to take a step back. And I went back university, like many of you here today, and that is when serendipity happened. And I met a man, a man from Spain, Julio, who went on to become my husband. He's actually sitting over here today. Uh, no, no need to clap. <laughs> no need to clap. But what was interesting about Julio was here was a Spaniard in London meeting an Indian. And what was he interested in? Not Spain, not Europe, not England, not India, but China. So back in 2000, I had him telling me that what we really need to do is move to China. And I was persuaded by this. It was a huge risk. It was a big pause. I did not speak Chinese. I did not have any contacts in China. Um, I did not have any friends in China. It was more or less a conceptual black hole to me at the time. But I moved there in 2002. And if I had not taken that pause, and if I had not taken that risk, I would never have embarked on this long, crazy global journey I've been on for the last 20 years. I went on 
to learn Chinese and to become the only Chinese-speaking Indian foreign correspondent based in China covering the bilateral relationship between two countries that together were a third of the world's population at a time when the importance of China was absolutely exploding globally. It was fascinating. It was front page new stuff every day. But what I realized, and what was interesting to me, and I want to bring this up since we began by talking about norms, was that I saw China, I viewed China quite differently from my Western foreign correspondent colleagues. And I'll give you two quick examples. One is something as simple, banal, and everyday as the traffic in Beijing. You see the traffic in Beijing? It is the same traffic in Beijing. But if you happen to be from Switzerland, or you happen to be from Germany, and you look at the traffic in Beijing, you normally think, oh my god, these people are crazy, they don't follow the rules, they're always going from the side, it's absolute chaos. If you happen to come from India, you see the same traffic, you think, oh my god, these people are so orderly, they follow all the rules. So you have exactly the same facts, the traffic, but diametrically different conclusions. Another quick example. I was there in 2008 when Beijing was hosting the Olympic Games. And in the run up to that, the official in charge of the Be uh, Beijing Olympic Games hosting committee was charged of a corruption kickbacks, of receiving kickbacks to the tune of hundreds of millions of US dollars. He was sacked and he was arrested. Both my Western foreign correspondent colleagues and I were shocked. But we were shocked for different reasons. They were shocked because of the corruption. I was shocked because he was sacked and arrested because my implicit norms as an Indian meant I was used to people in power getting away with impunity. After having spent seven plus years in China, we moved to Brussels quite the change. Belgium. It was the headquarters of the European Union. And the thing about being at the headquarters of the EU is that protesting workers were almost part of the scenery. Every day you had dock workers, farmers, taxi drivers, pharmacists that were striking in front of the EU headquarters demanding things. And initially when I saw these people through my India-China habituated lenses, I found it very difficult to have sympathy for them. These were not starving coal miners from northeast China whose family members were dying of lung cancer because of polluted air. These were not tribal women in India whose lands had been appropriated by rapacious coal mining bosses. These were the creme de la creme of the global labor elite. And I wondered if they realized just how privileged they were. They didn't. But over time, I did grow to have empathy with their situation because I realized that this was a relative loss of livelihood and that it is in fact much harder to give up something that you've never had than to make do with something that you've never had. So to give up something that you once had than to make do with something that you never had. And so I added a European lens to my growing collection of lenses. The next 10 years, I ended up moving to Indonesia to Tokyo, and now finally to Madrid. And many of these moves have been necessitated by my husband's job, who was a diplomat. And I think it is quite easy for trailing spouses or people in a situation who have to constantly move country um, to feel embittered about this, to feel as though they don't have a choice in the matter, that these decisions are being created by forces outside of their own control. But I chose to see each and every move as an opportunity of expansion, of expanding my identity, of expanding my ways of seeing the world, indeed, of expanding my way of being in the world. With each move, I experienced loss, learning, and reinvention. This is loss in the sense of financial loss, 
occasionally loss of status, definitely loss of friends, at least at the beginning. But I came to see this loss as a process of addition rather than subtraction. It was about taking the steps back that actually allowed you to grow, to find the emotional and the intellectual space that is necessary for keen observation, for reading, for learning languages, for listening. In the first few months that you are in a country, you see with all of your senses, when you are in a place for a long time and it becomes habitual, the extraordinary become invisible. But when you are new to a country, and I would argue that this is true about being new to a job or any experience really, you are not yet desensitized. You notice, for example, the manhole covers as you are walking on a street. If you are sitting in a cafe, you see the kind of body language that people have when they're chatting with each other. Are they expansive or do they shrink inwards? If you go for a walk to Retiro Park, you might actually look at the titles of the books that people are reading when they are sitting on park benches. And at the end of this process, when you never settle into a comfort zone, and you need to continually orient and reorient, you end up being more than you were before. You begin to carry these multiple worlds within you. And the fact is that we are living in an increasingly polarized world where we are sitting in these ideological silos. And this skill, simply put, the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes is increasingly rare, but it's never been more crucial. It's what makes human beings special. It's what artificial intelligence will probably never have. AI might beat us humans in chess. AI might even be better at managerial processes than many human managers. But where humans trump machines is in empathy. It's what makes humans special. And the fact is that this process of gaining empathy is never a linear process. It is a dance. It is a shuffle of steps backwards and forwards. I have gone on to report on every country that I've lived in, and I've sort of built up a collection about, of about seven or eight books that I have written, both fiction and non-fiction. And my life's work has really been to join up the dots that connect us, and to see bridges where others see fences. The truth is messy, it's complicated, it doesn't fit into neat boxes. But to reach this understanding may require a step back, because it is only by doing so that you don't take a step forward, but 10 steps forward. Thank you very much.